Thank you, uh, Jim, Dan, and uh, Rami for the invitation to be here. Um, it's been a great meeting so far. And uh, that was a great talk, uh, uh, Tass. And <clears throat> we do have some experience with fours at our institution. I do think that, uh, that those new non-radiation-based image-guided systems uh, are gonna be the, the future, even more so, I think, than the robotics, at least in the near future, because you, you can significantly reduce radiation and, and it actually enhances your ability to do things because you can look at things in angles that you can't achieve with just moving the uh, the C the arm uh, around. Um, I'm gonna speak today about some of the techniques that we utilize for uh, alternative access, so to speak, uh, in some of the complex uh, aortic interventions that we do. Uh, these are my disclosures. So more and more, we're trying to avoid some of the alternative access and not come from the upper extremity to reduce stroke risk and simplify procedures and having tools like these steerable sheaths uh, has now enabled us to do a lot of these cases purely using uh, femoral access, um, even for downward uh, oriented branches. Um, that being said, uh, some cases just really can't be done well from below. And so I think we still have to be versatile. I, I remember I trained with somebody who said, always told me, be versatile and practice your backhand. So, so um, <clears throat> I think that we can't just dismiss coming from upper extremity approaches, particularly when you get into some really complex anatomies with tortuosity and occlusive disease and existing devices in place that make it just uh, nearly impossible to do these cases purely from below. We've adopted uh, uh, percutaneous axillary artery uh, access approaches uh, when we need an upper extremity approach for our complex uh, EVAR. So this is typically what we end up doing with uh, starting out with bilateral percutaneous femoral access, but also percutaneous axillary artery access either on the left or the right side, depending on patient anatomy and some ergonomic considerations uh, as well. I'll talk to you about how we do this. We have a pretty large experience now. And there are some real keys because it's a little bit different than utilizing uh, femoral artery approaches. So positioning is key. You really have to have the patient with the arm prepped in so that you also have access to the brachial and radial arteries if you need to get out of trouble in the end. Abducting the arm to 90 degrees on an arm board. We use an articulated arm board that once we gain access, we can then fold the arm board back in and put the arm back at the patient's side so it's not sticking out for the whole case. But this straightens the artery reduces some of the redundancy and makes it easier and safer to access. Ultrasound guidance is absolutely essential. I know a lot of the cardiologists use purely fluoroscopic guidance, but uh, you really can see some of the nerves and other uh, 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 anatomic um, structures in that location to make sure that you can do this uh, safely. We also tend to use a more shallow uh, approach angle with our micropuncture needle so that you're not making a, a sharp or an acute turn when you're entering the artery so that it's a much more gentle approach because this is a, a delicate artery that can be some somewhat mobile uh, in this location. We've now adopted accessing the artery in the uh, second portion of the axillary artery. We actually puncture through the pec minor uh, muscle. In this area, it's pretty easy to find a spot that's free of any uh, brachial plexus elements or anything anteriorly. And also importantly, this is a location where you can compress manually for hemostasis, compressing the artery against the uh, second rib. Uh, so, so those are the reasons that we utilize that second portion. This is the view that you're looking for on your ultrasound. So you can actually see the pec major and pec minor muscles to know that you're in the second portion of the axillary artery. We depress the ultrasound probe to show that the muscle is right against the uh, vessel wall so that we know that there's no interposed other structures like brachial plexus in the way that we're going to injure uh, with our access. So this is the view that you want to see. Once we uh, gain access, I usually use a stiff glide wire for support to introduce the per-closed devices, and we use a standard pre-closed technique. The tactile feels a little bit different, so you have to get used to it because it's, it's, it's just different than the femoral artery. Uh, but And there is a learning curve, but uh, once you get used to that, you get used to the feel and those tactile cues that you can get as well. <clears throat> 
When we're uh, introducing then the larger sheaths from our axillary approach, we uh, typically almost always do it over a through wire that stabilizes things and allows you to very gently uh, advance that uh, device in one pass across the aortic arch to minimize any manipulation uh, in that area. And we typically leave that through wire in place to stabilize the sheath while we're working. It's usually a 12 French sheath that we use. Uh, really important also is making sure that you have a safe exit strategy. So what happens if your per close fails? How are you going to get out of uh, trouble and not hurt the patient? So typically at the end of the case, after we've done our branched or fenestrated repair, over that through wire, we'll advance a long seven or eight French sheath over the through wire from the groin, telescope it up into that axillary sheath. Once we've got that uh, femoral sheath up to the subclavian artery, we'll withdraw the axillary sheath, we'll wire in both directions so that we have two safety wires in place from both of our access sites, and only then will we remove the sheath and tighten the per close sutures testing our closure. Through that sheath we brought up from the femoral access, while we still have wire access, we can actually do angiography, make sure that we're going to get a hemostatic closure, and then if we're happy with that, we'll remove the axillary wire tighten and lock the per-closed sutures, and again document that we have a hemostatic closure. Now, uh, sometimes things fail, and uh, I'm not perfect at doing this, and we've had uh, uh, failures. If you puncture that second portion, you can manually compress the artery and obtain hemostasis while you're trying to figure out what you're going to do. Hopefully, you've kept all of your guide wires in place and done this safely, and then it's pretty easy to get control. You can get balloon control. You can reinsert the uh, sheath. You can try balloon-assisted hemostasis uh, results. You can try to deploy an additional closure device. That usually doesn't work. Usually what does work is uh, delivering and deploying a uh, covered stent. We usually use a self-expanding Viabon covered stent because it's uh, uh, flexible and not crushable in that location. And of course, you always could do a surgical repair, and that's part of the reason also not to access the first portion of the uh, uh, axillary artery so that you can get proximal control if you had to cut down. So uh, this is a case here where we've deployed a, uh, a self-expanding Viabon. We've done this in a few cases, a handful of cases. We've not had any issues with, uh, with these stents uh, uh, going down. They, they tend to perform actually quite well in this location. And in a lot of the patients, when you're getting your follow-up CTAs, it include the chest as well as the abdomen and pelvis. You can see your covered stent in the axillary artery and, and, and continue to follow it with surveillance that way. We've uh, uh, published and presented our series on a couple of occasions now. Most recently at the VAM meeting, we presented a series of 92 patients that we had treated uh, uh, in our uh, uh, physician-sponsored IDE study. We used up to 16 French uh, profile sheaths. Uh, the bulk of them were 12 French dry seal sheaths. In seven of those 92 patients, so under 10%, we had closure failure. They uh, were all treated with covered stent placement. We had no conversions to open surgical repair. We've had a couple uh, other local access related complications. I think this is a lot of this was earlier on and related to learning curve until we figured out how to do this. Uh, uh, well, uh, and that was some transient, probably uh, nerve issues with uh, transient weakness or paresthesias in, in some patients. With uh, any upper extremity access or stroke risk, I don't think it's specific to this technique. We had two patients. Uh, one was unrelated and hemorrhagic, but another one was a possibly related embolic stroke on the ipsilateral side. Uh, and then importantly, we've had 100% axillary artery patency. We've not had any arteries go down utilizing this technique. Uh, certainly, uh, just like there are cases that you can't do from below, there are cases that you really shouldn't even consider doing from the upper extremity. So we always assess this on the preoperative uh, CT angiograms. You can evaluate the subclavian artery, the vessel diameters to make sure that they're not too small. You want to know that you don't have complex arch anatomy and especially uh, thrombus in the, in the so-called shaggy aorta. That's just, just asking for trouble if you try to put catheters in through that arch. I'll speak a little bit also uh, some techniques that we utilize to reestablish early pelvic and lower extremity perfusion uh, in the interest of avoiding getting ischemic leg problems, but more importantly, uh, um, optimizing collateral spinal cord blood flow and reducing risks of spinal cord injury and in extensive or complex aneurysm repairs. So one of the things that we do, particularly in branched approaches that lend themselves to this, that as soon as we get that branch device in place, the distal bifurcated aortoiliac uh, stent graft and the iliac limb, we'll try to immediately downsize 
synthesize that large femoral sheath to a smaller sheath, usually a seven French sheath. And utilizing the pre-close uh, or the per close sutures that you've put in place, and we use kind of this uh, pediatric Ramel tourniquet. This was initially described by Azizade for obtaining hemostasis after you removed everything and tightened the sutures, putting a little uh, uh, um, tubing down over the suture and cinching down on that to help with some tamponade and hemostasis. But this also is an effective technique for, for holding the uh, suture tight uh, around a downsized sheath. So we use this pediatric uh, 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 Ramel tourniquet. Um, and what we do, and I think I've got a video here, is usually you've got two per close sutures. Usually the, you only need one of these to get this to work. And that way you, you have the second one as a backup in case you inadvertently lock the suture uh, doing this. But what we do is we exchange that large sheath for a seven front sheath here. Uh, I usually use a seven front sheath because then you can always come back with another per close device in a seven French hole at the end and, and tighten that. Then we kind of cinch down just on the rail suture, not the locking suture. Uh, and then that can obtain hemostasis around that downsized sheath. And you can look at this with angiography, it's hemostatic. And because of the, the low profile sheath that you now have in place, you've, you've reestablished early uh, normal lower extremity uh, uh, perfusion. So uh, to wrap up here, percutaneous access for complex EVAR procedures is definitely uh, safe and effective. It does avoid the morbidity, blood loss, and added times of uh, surgical cut down. So we try to do everything percutaneously uh, if, if we can. Uh, I like axillary access for target visceral artery stenting, especially when you've got challenging iliac and femoral uh, um, access issues. And it's also very useful when you're doing stage or sequential deployment techniques where you have to come into the device from above and you can't do that from below. It should really be avoided when there's significant arch disease. And there's definitely a learning curve with some of these uh, more advanced techniques. So you first want to be facile with uh, pre-close and femoral access before you start branching out. But I think that these are valuable techniques for all surgeons uh, doing complex aortic work. Thanks. Thank you.